in the last section, I started talking about motor tract lesions and pathologies. So we're going to talk more about that in this section. So I want you to be able to describe the signs of motor tract lesions. I want you to be able to define clonus, myoplasticity, and spasticity, and the difference between a clasp knife response and lead pipe rigidity. So clasp knife and lead pipe are both two types of muscle rigidity um, that you will get in response to passive range of motion. And we'll talk about the difference between the two. So clonus is an involuntary repeating and rhythmic muscle contraction. Unsustained clonus um, fades after a few beats, even with maintained muscle stretch. Sustained clonus is always pathologic in origin and is produced when a lack of motor tract control allows the activation of oscillating neural networks in the spinal cord. People with um, chronic spinal cord injury or other motor tract lesions um, can have sustained clonus of the soleus muscle triggered by the placement of the foot on a wheelchair footrest um, or triggered by dorsiflexion. Sometimes you can count the number of beats of clonus and sometimes it just goes on. So um, a lot of people with um, uh, multiple sclerosis have um, soleus muscle clonus when your, their foot in a, is in a dorsiflex position. Um, sometimes you'll be getting someone into a standing frame or something like that, and as soon as you get them in that dorsiflex position, um, they, they have that sustained clonus. So um, we'll, there are lots of different strategies that you can use to help deal with clonus, and you will talk about some of those in your, um, your uh, neuro rehab class. So um, we talked about in the uh, motor neuron section, we talked about myoclonus. A myoclonus is one contraction. Clonus, without the myo on it, is a repeating rhythmic muscle contraction. So it's like the, the foot taps almost when you have the soleus clonus. And it's really often triggered in the soleus muscle. The clasp nice, uh, knife response occurs when a paretic muscle is slowly and passively stretched and the resistance drops at a specific point in the range of motion. So the reason they call it um, clasp knife is because the change in resistance is similar to when you open a pocket knife. There's initially strong resistance to opening the knife blade and then it gives way to easier movement. So type two afferents elicit the clasp uh, clasp knife response. So those are the um, the uh, Golgi tendon organ, the the um, tendon uh, afferents. So you're um, you're getting you're trying to move their um, muscle, stretch it slowly, and it gives you resistance, 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 and then at a specific point in the range of motion, the resistance drops, and that you can move it easily. So that's the clasp knife response. With rigid, with lead pipe rigidity, it is you meet resistance throughout the range of motion. It doesn't drop off at the specific point. So you can think of it as you know moving a lead pipe. That's why they call it lead pipe versus clasp knife. So I don't know who came up with these terms, but somebody did. These ones at least are descriptive, and you can kind of figure it out. So clasp knife has. Um, resistance which drops at a specific point in the range and lead pipe rigidity it's rigid throughout the range of motion myoplasticity is adaptive changes within a muscle in response to neuromuscular activity level and prolonged positioning so myoplasticity is the change of muscles um, like contractures muscles um, adapted to a shortened position and they can make a lot of things difficult. They can make dressing difficult, hygiene, positioning, and um, self-mobility with a wheelchair. If you have um, elbow flexion contractures, you might not be able to reach down far enough to propel the wheelchair. So um, I've, I've worked with people who had that elbow flexion contractures and we were working on um, using ultrasound, um, moist heat packs, manual therapy, manual stretching, 
to um, decrease the and um, dynamic splinting to decrease um, elbow flexion contractures and I've had people who were completely dependent because they couldn't reach down far enough to propel their wheelchair um, and after working in PT for several weeks on diminishing the contracture um, I've gotten them to a point where they can actually propel the wheelchair on their own and that's a huge difference in independence a huge difference and it makes um, transferring easier too so um, when you think about some of these pathologies think about how it would affect a person and what they do in a day in day-to-day -day life and if we can help them um, either um, rehabilitate or compensate for some of these things it can make their life a lot easier so following motor tract lesions um, muscle disuse atrophy is less severe because you still have intact motor neurons that provide normal neurochemical input to skeletal muscles um, disuse atrophy decreases the motor cortex representation of the disused body parts which leads to further paresis so if you're it's a use it or lose it thing if you don't lose use your muscles the motor cortex says eh I guess I don't need these and and your body map in your motor cortex um, changes so it's not just a, a um, muscle disuse atrophy is not just at the muscle level it's it has repercussions throughout the nervous system into the brain into the motor cortex so remember muscle tone is the resistance to stretch and resting muscle and um, abnormal muscle tone is categorized on a continuum so resistance ranges from flaccid which is complete lack of resistance like you touch the muscle and it's just um, rubbery you know it doesn't doesn't give you any resistance abnormally low muscle tone is hypotonia normal muscle tone is what you feel in your own muscles um, velocity dependent hypertonia which is also known as spasticity it's abnormally high resistance that increases with faster movement so the causes of flaccidity and hypertonicity so flaccid when you talk about the spectrum of muscle tone flaccidity is on one end and hypertonicity is on the other so um, both can be caused by motor neuron lesions um, developmental disorders usually caused by intracranial hemorrhage immune genetic or me uh, metabolic disorders so um, CP you can have um, usually hypertonicity with CP but there are other um, developmental disorders that cause flaccidity um, acute motor tract lesions that cause central nervous system shock like spinal cord injuries can cause flaccidity or hypotonicity so um, the um, the whole spectrum of muscle tone can be affected by um, different disorders hypertonia is so hypotonia is the less response to passive stretch hypertonia is um, an abnormally strong resistance to passive stretch and it can be caused by um, chronic motor tract lesions or some basal ganglia disorders like Parkinson's it's a hypertonic disorder um, or it can be there are two types of hypertonia velocity dependent and rigid usually with Parkinson's it's rigid spasticity is velocity dependent hypertonia so in spasticity the amount of resistance to passive movement depends on the velocity of the movement so a slower movement there might not be a lot of resistance you do a faster movement and you get more resistance um, both changes in muscle tissue and neuromuscular overactivity contribute to velocity dependent hypertonia and there are um, two mechanisms that produce neural overactivity hyperreflexia and reticulospinal tract overactivity um, so with spasticity I'll give you an example of um, of some things that I've seen in the clinic so uh, one time working with a person in the pool we have underwater treadmills in our pool um, an underwater camera so I had her walking on the treadmill in the pool and her gait looked pretty normal at slower speeds um, once we st um, start once I tar started turning up the speed on the treadmill then her gait became more abnormal because she had increased spasticity with increased velocity of movement
So um, sometimes you'll you'll see that um, if, if with slow movements things work pretty well, and then when you try to do a normal rate movement, you get spasticity. So um, a lot of different neurological um, injuries and illnesses can result in spasticity, and there are some there are some specific um, techniques that you can use to help reduce spasticity. So spasticity affects approximately 20% of people with stroke, 47 to 70% of people with MS, 34% um, of people with spinal cord injury, and more than 90% of people with CP have spasticity, and 50% of people with traumatic brain injury. So um, you, can't, you can't really measure spasticity. There are often inconsistent scores, but you can note spasticity. Um, you can say that they had, like my example of the person on the treadmill in the pool, um, when they got to a certain speed, they exhibited um, spasticity with their um, gait movements. Rigidity is resistant to pass, resistance to passive movement that remains constant regardless of the speed of force application. So um, rigidity is velocity dependent. That should be independent, excuse me. Uh, spasticity is velocity dependent hypertonia. Rigidity is velocity independent hypertonia. So um, there are there are pictures of this in the book with um, brain injuries. Um, there are two different specific um, patterns of um, rigidity. Um, Deseparate rigidity is rigid extension of the upper limbs, and decorticate rigid um, rigidity is flexed upper limbs. And extended neck and lower limbs in plantar flexion. So look at those pictures in the um, text and um, kind of see the difference between the two. Some basal ganglia disorders also cause rigidity. Rigidity is one of the cardinal signs of Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a basal ganglia disorder. So um, it's it's neither decorticate or disturbate rigidity with Parkinson's. It's just overall um, muscle rigidity. So um, the loss of the interruption of uh, lateral corticospinal signals prevents fractionation and it profoundly affects the ability to use the hand. So a lot of times after a stroke, people have their, um, they have really difficult, uh, a lot of difficulty using one hand because they, um, the lateral corticospinal tract signals were um, interrupted and they can't um, do fine movements with their hand. So um, myoplasticity with loss of fractionation of movement, you get contracture, atrophy, and weak actin myosin bonding. So a lot of times after stroke, the contracture is people's hand is sort of in a fist and it's hard to get their fingers stretched out. Um, people who um, work on uh, neurological hand treatment work a lot on um, getting out of that contracture position. Um, spasticity is the velocity dependent hypertonia during stretch. Hyperreflexia, you get um, increased muscle spindle input leading to overactivity. And reticulospinal tract overactivity is excessive um, signals to the motor neurons. So abnormal co-contraction and abnormal muscle synergies. Abnormal co-contraction occurs only in developmental spasticity. Um, abnormal muscle synergies occur most often in a specific type of stroke. And we'll talk more about stroke in the um, chapter that refers to that. So with cerebral palsy, the um, spastic cerebral palsy, the subtype, you get abnormal um, supraspinal influences, failure of normal neuronal selection, and aberrant muscle development that lead to movement dysfunction. So the motor disorders in, in spastic CP include problems with coordination, abnormal tonic stretch reflexes both at rest and during movement, reflex irradiation where one reflex is stimulated and it sets off another one, um, lack of postural preparation before movement, and abnormal co-contraction of muscles. So a lot of times in CP, you're working with people on um, movement control and coordination and um, stretching out the muscles. There are a lot of um, medic uh, medication treatments that work on spasticity. Um, 
baclofen and some of the related drugs, tizanidine, um, can uh, work on decreasing spasticity um, from the um, motor neuron end, or from the motor tract end, excuse me. Um, but that is something that someone with CP is always going to have to deal with. It's not going to go away. So that's the, um, the thing with motor tract lesions. They're not going away. Um, you have to learn how to deal with them. Um, so the common signs of motor tract lesions um, include paresis, paralysis, abnormal timing of muscle activity because you lose that fractionation, positive Babinski sign, and myoplastic changes, those contractures. Um, most commonly with chronic SCI, you get hyperreflexia um, of the phasic muscle stretch reflex, clonus, abnormal withdrawal reflexes, and the clasp knife phenomenon. With um, ALS, um, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, it destroys only motor neurons and motor tracts, and the destruction is bilateral. So you get motor tract signs and motor neuron signs with um, ALS. You get paresis, hyperreflexia, positive Babinski's, hyporeflexia. So hyperreflexia is a motor tract sign, hyporeflexia is a motor neuron sign, and you get them both with ALS. You also get muscle atrophy, myoplastic changes, um, hypotonia, atrophy, and fibrillations. So um, it's it's a really difficult disease to deal with because it has a um, an unpredictable progression, um, bilateral destruction, uh, a lot of times really quick loss in all these things, and um, it's a very challenging disease. One of my aunts um, died of ALS, and um, it was uh, really tough to see. So for normal movement, motor planning areas, control circuits, and descending tracks have to act together with sensory information to provide instruction to motor neurons. Motor tracks convey signals from the brain to motor neurons and to interneurons. Um, the most important lateral muscle tract is the lateral corticospinal tract. That's where most of our voluntary movement comes from. Um, cortico brainstem tracts control muscles in the head and superficial muscles in the neck. And nonspecific tracts increase activity in spinal interneurons and motor neurons.